Um, so I'm Andy Warfield again. Uh, probably won't do this too many more times, but um, I'm the, one of the founders of, uh, of Coho. Um, and I've just finished talking about our products, our product GA, uh, which is a scalable storage product for uh, uh, virtualized environments in the GA. And now I'm going to talk about the architecture of the thing um, and how we put together very high performance flash, very crappy performance disks, um, and a network tier to build a converged storage and network system. Um, okay, so the, this is what the system looks like um, to us. I just need to, if I'm not careful, I will talk right through the end of this and Forbes will be very angry at me. So I have to just keep checking my, uh, my watch. Um, so rather than building uh, a rated storage system where you traditionally think about you know, stacking up lots and lots of disks, right? Um, or even a distributed disk-based storage system where you just stack up lots of disks, right? We've done this thing of this microarray style building block, right? So we have an addressable flash device, a CPU that drives it, and a 10 gig port right, that, it, that it connects over. And so our system is naturally distributed. Right? And we wanted to do this great scale out thing, but the extra sort of hand tied behind our back problem that we faced as a startup is we had to get to a product inside two years in terms of relevance in the market. And so we thought very hard, and we have a strong background in terms of virtualization. We understand that customer. And so we decided that we would focus on virtualization, <coughs> virtualized environments in our GA. So the architecture is much broader than what the GA does. But the GA specifically focuses on VMware um, and more generally virtualized environments. Now, the way that that complicates things is for IP storage on VMware, you got two choices, right? There's iSCSI and NFS. And it's not even good NFS, right? It's, it's old NFS. Um, and if you go the, uh, the iSCSI path, right, you either take a uh, cluster file system uh, on top of you in the form of VMFS, and then you can't see what's happening from the storage provider level, or you do uh, uh, direct mappings, right, which is also uh, uncomfortable from an administrative perspective. So we opted for NFS. And so now we have this problem, which is on NFS, um, I need to make a single IP address, right? Scale a whole bunch of devices, okay? And so that's where we started looking at what was possible in terms of uh, software-defined networking, right? There are these really, really interesting new switches that have come out. They let you do stuff that you could never do on switches before, and we include one in the product. We make very aggressive use of it. Um, I'm gonna talk about the way we use the SDN switch in a little bit. What I'm going to talk about first is how this stuff works. So these things are so performance dense that they look a lot like CPUs did when we virtualized CPUs. OK? Does that make sense? Like the, you know, the whole thing with CPUs prior to VMware and Zen and so on was that the server was being used as an administrative boundary, right? And the CPU was idle, right? And packing it more densely meant that you could get a lot more value out of the CPU. Flash looks exactly like this. And so we have taken a very CPU style approach, CPU virtualization style approach to this. Right? Basically, at the flash device, we virtualize the flash, right, in a very sort of hypervisor style way. We have a thin chunk of code that runs above the flash and disk, and all it's responsible for doing is giving you address spaces, right, giving you virtual flash devices effectively, right, and it tears cold data off to disk behind that. And that is effectively presented as an object store, right? So you can kind of think of these as taking a whole bunch of flash devices and giving you a storage equivalent of a virtual machine, right? It just gives you this container for data on that device. And all of the things that you are sort of familiar with doing to virtual machines, like migrating them around and stuff like that, that's what that container is used for, for us, right? On top of this, we layer, oops, oh, whoops, a second layer, and this integrates with the switch a lot, where we have data profiles right, that present that out. Right? They're responsible for composing these objects into richer abstractions. And so by working with the switch at this layer, we build basically a hosted environment where we run our NFS controller, but the NFS controller can scale horizontally across as many of these boxes as you have. Right? So that IP address that ends in, in one of these, right, when you add another box, the NFS controller scales out you know, across them like that. Um, and so, let me maybe be a little bit more concrete about this. Okay, so this is, this is a visualization of the, uh, 
of the way the system works. This is in our UI, right? This is just to explain uh, what we do. So, um, each of these things is a flash device, a 10 gig port, and a CPU, right? So that two U box, you can kind of think of as being this row, right? Pairwise, two of those 10 gig ports share a motherboard, right? They share a power supply, so you don't want to replicate across those, right? So we have this notion of topology built into the system, and so those two, right, basically, you know, live on one physical server right, inside the system, those two live on the other side, right? So this is a bunch of these things working together, right? And so, uh, Alistair, this is where I'm going to get to your question about, uh, about scale-out. Um, so rather than starting from the bottom, right, building a storage system and going like, okay, I'm going to rate it up and then I'm going to, you know, apply some hashing or something like that, right, and, and scale it out, kind of started from the top. So in this system, here's a VM. This object actually has placement policy associated with it. Right, there are some constraints. The constraints for this object say, this needs to be striped eight ways, and each stripe needs to be replicated twice. Okay, so there's policy on the object that says, this is how I would like you to place this data. The system internally solves a constraint satisfaction problem. Right? It looks at all of these things, and it comes up with a placement that satisfies them for all the objects. And so if I look inside this thing, right, what you see is, Right? It is placed pairwise across sets of nodes on both sides of the fault domain. Right? Similarly, if I look inside here, this is hosting a bunch of objects that are replicated across nodes on the other side. Right? If I kill this box, the constraint satisfaction stuff comes in and it moves the data around in response to the fact that the environment has changed. Right? If I go and add additional <laughs> hardware to this thing, <clears throat> right? Like I rack another two of those things, the system comes in and moves the data around. And you have a specific number, you, I mean eight obviously is a nice number, it matches our binary love and uh, a lot of things. Was there a reason why you chose eight versus four versus six or anything else? Like what, what was your failure scenario where you decided that that had to be there and where you still win on the performance side? Do you mean... As far I, as like the eight locales for, for, oh, for writes, striping? Yeah. Totally arbitrary. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, we made the decision in the initial release that we would do striping it ways, right, and two replication. Um, this is all parameterized under the hood, um, but this is like the default policy in the, in the release. This is one aspect where, you know, the stuff that we're building is more general than what we're exposing in the, in the GA. How much but is tunable uh, at our side if we wanted to, you know, broaden that? Or you really want to tune, so? we, can, we can talk about it. Right, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's there. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of this is that, uh, you know, we anticipate doing significantly different stuff on this path as we go. <coughs> but, you know, this is, we wanted to build something that was, that was going to work for the moment. And so, you know, th that's basically the, the gist of this thing, right? The, the system, you know, is responding to changes in, in its environment, right? And moving the data around dynamically in response to that. So the two knobs that the system has in terms of dynamism are it can move the data and it can move the connections. You talk about uh, fault domains. Uh, is a single box a fault domain, or uh, ha how do you decide where replicate the data? So right now, this is a fault domain. Okay. Right. It has redundant power. Right. We would never place both replicas on this, but we will replicate across sides in the box. The topology in here, and this goes to Alistair's question, is intended to be more general than that because. What we anticipate is we scale out are two specific situations. One is you end up with multiple racks of this gear with narrower pipes between the racks. Right? And so there are reasons both to put replicas on the other side of it and not to. Right? You want to minimize that traffic, but you also want resiliency there. Right? So there's a topology engine you know, that, that accommodates that kind of thing. Right? We, we don't do that in here, but it's, it's cooked in as, as we grow. Um, the, uh, the other end of that, sorry, is, is the point that, that Alistair made, which is that these things are not going to be uniform next year, right? Next year's stuff will be twice as fast and twice as big. And so this placement stuff already accommodates capacity, um, but as we go forward, it will accommodate, you know, load characteristics of these devices, right? So it's, it's, it's just doing constraint satisfaction type stuff. Um, okay, does that kind of make sense in terms of how that level of the system works? Okay. Let me go back. Oops, not there. Here. So, 
what I'm trying to do in this talk is give you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of roadmap as, as well as what we do now. Um, and so what I showed you before was the GA in terms of just doing NFS, right? Really, um, this layer is intended to be much more general, right? And so we focused on NFS as one way to present the data. But the system's designed to host another way, so we will do uh, SMB. Um, this IO bypass box is, is quite interesting in that um, that graph that I showed you, right, the, the tree of locations for data, is actually a, uh, we call it internally a data path, right? It's a delegated data path. And so there's a bit of code, right? You can kind of think of it as a library, right? This lib data path. And this is, you know, this is implemented in C, right? There's this piece of software that implements that data path. You feed in reads or writes up the top, and what comes out the bottom are um, Right? So you, you ask it to read some range of an object, it runs it very quickly through that dispatch graph, right? and it tells you what requests you need to place on the network to get that data. If you happen to do a request that straddles two of those stripes, it breaks it appropriately into two requests to go out to the data, right? and so on. And so this thing, we link into our NFS implementation. Right? So our NFS code is really just an implementation of the NFS protocol mapping down onto this lib data path. We did an experiment last year where we took MySQL running in a VM and just linked this into the MySQL block layer, right? And so the idea there is now MySQL doesn't talk NFS, right? MySQL now talks to these virtualized devices, right? And they can be coexisting, right? The design of the system is basically that this is scaffolding to get off of this NFS problem that we have, <laughs> right? That, that all of these things are effectively tenants Right, of the storage environment, and that they can run side by side. Right? And so the direction that we are headed is in exposing new protocols right, and more direct interfaces down onto the flash. Right? So that's, that's really what the system is kind of heading toward as we go forward. We're just being really pragmatic about what we build in the short term. Um, one, one thing on yeah. this, Andy. I I'm, I'm just want to clarify the data hypervisor. Each of these nodes, which has got the two PCIe flash devices, is it ru effectively running two copies of that data hypervisor? Yes, right. yes, yeah. yeah they're that, that, that straight sort of pipelining through the 10 gig E, through the CPU to the PCIe flash mm -hmm. is, is a construct within the software. Exactly, not, exactly. Not bound. We're, uh, and, and we're, uh, we're, we're always, uh, we spend a lot of time on this. It's, it's been, you know, I, I come from a, like a really sort of performance centric software background. I, I love building fast stuff. And uh, the, the, the ruminations inside the company on this stuff are getting to the point where we are even going finer grain than that. And we're looking at doing things like exposing individual cores as network addressable things <coughs> to pipeline right, that path, right? Basically pipeline a direct path off of the NIC through the processor to, you know, you know, Q to Q, basically. Just getting rid of any kind of cache interference or things like that on the, on the system as you go through. Um, okay, so before I talk about the SDN stuff, um, I'm quickly gonna just show you the UI, right? So I'll try and go back and forth a little bit in terms of high level stuff and gory stuff. Um, so the, the UI is something that, um, that we've, we've spent um, quite a bit of time on. Uh, we actually built it once, we did our initial little POCs, we got a bunch of feedback and then we <coughs> threw it out and, uh, and built it again. Um, and so, I, I've, said this, uh, I've said this in the past, my, my experience with, uh, with storage uh, UIs is that uh, they're remarkably similar to most of the uh, Wi-Fi routers that I owned in the 90s and early 2000s, right? uh, even to a lesser degree today. Um, what we really wanted to do was to, it's, this is kind of, uh, the VGA is making this a bit choppy, but I hope you can kind of get the idea of what's going on here. Um, I, we really wanted to build a system that decoupled the physical hardware, right, from what you're managing, right? So the intention here is that, you know, over the five years, you're installing additional hardware and you're potentially end of life in pieces of hardware. The data is moving around as, as necessary, right? You're not in this forklift upgrade kind of mode. Right? And so this UI is intended to expose you know, the, the workload aspect of storage management um, instead, of, instead of so much right, really being this really, really rigidly phys physical thing. And so uh, you get a dashboard. 
Um, everybody in this room is going uh, to like this one aspect of the system, which is that it, it tweets, right? It, it doesn't actually tweet, but it's got this like Twitter style metaphor, which is that on the left, there are action items, right, that it posts little messages to you on, and there's an activity stream, which is stuff that is informational, right? You don't need to care, uh, but stuff comes up here when it happens. So this is just a, uh, it's got a, a simulator of the system, and behind it, if I fail a disk here, um, am I on this? Should the keys work on this? Depends yeah. which one it is. Pardon? Depends which one it is, because there's, there's three of them running. Didn't pray to the live demo gods this morning. Uh, <laughs> demo it is. It's the jar of pickled pig's feet that we don't have. <laughs> yeah. Difficult to see. Oh, wait, you need one of those? Hold on. Flick to one of the other ones. <laughs> flick to the rebalance one, it'll probably work on that one. Oh. That was the juju that you needed on top of the Netware 3.0 three to 3.1 upgrade. That's fine. <clears throat> the reason it's not picking up the keyboard, so I'm just not going to in inject any events in this. But if a disk failed, <laughs> you would see something coming up here saying, you know, a disk has failed, you need to go and look at it. You can draw the system, right? So everything you can do to help uh, somebody that has to go into a server room is good. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, a builder here that you can use to draw your rack, right, and place things. You can place other servers in here. And, uh, you know, you can basically, it will indicate that this chassis has a failed disk, right? You can click on the chassis. Right, you can see the disks, the disk goes red. If you fail it, we blink the light on the back of the disk, right? It's just intended to be really straightforward this way, right? Similarly, um, the switch uh, up here, right, shows you status and all the links on the switch, right, and what's going on. So if you cable wrong or you've dropped below 10 gig, right, the system tells you that you've, you know, something is wrong at the hardware level. Um, when we move in a deployment from a single switch to a dual switch, right, if you want redundancy, the system guides you through the rewiring. Right, it gives you, a, you know, on this switch, take this port and move it to this switch, this port. Right, it's, it's intended to facilitate that level of things. Um, that's about it for the hardware end of things. Everything else is, is actually data management. So we give you this top level view, right? We give you, I want to make sure I'm, yeah. We give you this view of hotspots here um, that is intended, like I said earlier, we want all of your hot data in flash. Right? The disparity in performance between flash and disk is so awful right, that you don't want to mostly be in flash. You really want to always be in flash. Right? It's just cold stuff that should be coming off the disks. And so what we're trying to do is help you size the system to keep your hot data in flash. And so this view is, over the last week, what were my latencies like? Right? It's just a one screen, you know, did I have latency problems over the week? And if your latencies creep over 15 milliseconds, right, you, you, know, you really kind of hammering flash, right? The system's really backing up. You go yellow for a brief period of time, right? If you go over seconds, right, something's going wrong, right? You're onto the disks and that's, that's red. And so in here, right, and Forbes will talk more about this, you can kind of zoom in and identify the problematic workloads. Um, there's two actions there, right? In some cases, you should fix your workloads, right? If you've stacked up all of your file system defragmentation that you shouldn't be doing in a virtual environment anyways, or you're indexing all your database at once, right? You can stagger those and, and take some load off, but otherwise you can scale out the flash. Um, the other uh, bits of performance views in here are basically, you know, we've got live graphing off the system for latency, IOPS, throughput, and capacity, right? And on any of these things, it's completely searchable, right? So if I want to go look at latency in here and I want to focus on a VM, right, I can type in and there's my Exchange VM right there. And I can turn that on, and I can see the graph for it, right, superimposed in here. And I can... Is there any pushback in into the main <coughs> hypervisor layer? So do you guys push this into uh, you know, the vSphere client? Right now, this client, client is, uh, is web-based, but we're, we're going to be releasing a, a, a tab for, uh, for this stuff. And of course, we talk about the different hypervisors that are there. You know, VMware, obviously, a big uh, candidate for stuff, yeah, but VMware will be the you first know, one. You with obviously you've touched on Zen before. I think you may have had some experience <laughs> in there. Yeah, uh, we, what uh, about looking at uh, at running against KVM and and some more stuff that's going to sit in the OpenStack layers? So there's 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 two. Wow. Okay. There's there's a few other potential UIs that we could work with, right? Um, 
Uh, Hyper-V is really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't found. Uh, I haven't found. So we've had a Sorry. lot of. <laughs> we've had a whole bunch of Hyper-V interests. Um, but the uh, first question we ask, you know, people that are interested from the Hyper-V side is, how many servers are you virtualizing? And usually they say two, right, or three, right? We haven't. We just haven't seen a lot of really big Hyper-V environments. You have one. Got a hundred. Oh, that's, that's good. A <coughs> hundred servers or VMs. Uh, VMs. Oh, 100 VMs. Yeah. A dozen <laughs> hosts. Okay. It's bigger than most of what I've seen on Hyper V. Yeah, I've so got far. four in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's one thing, right? The, we're, we're very keen to, to, to support other stuff. On the Hyper V side, we, we just haven't seen the environments that are, that are pulling it. On the OpenStack stuff, um, again, there's clearly large scale OpenStack deployments, um, but there's not really a unified UI on that stuff uh, that, that we're getting a lot of pull on. Well, the challenge so. we often get with OpenStack, like a lot of open source stuff, and God, don't take this wrong, I love open source, but quite often when open source stuff doesn't get written as drivers, it becomes the fault of the consumer. They're like, why didn't you just write the driver? Like, because I don't really know that much about Python to go bury it in and, right. and build it out there. So do you guys know if you have a roadmap for building in Cinder support or you know specific blocks? So Cinder or? and this UI on the web supporting OpenStack will happen later this year. Okay. Right. And in fact, if anybody here or anybody uh, that's watching this is interested in this and has a reasonable OpenStack deployment, I would love to talk to you right around um, around what your needs are, uh, because really this end of things is just kind of decoration on top of NFS, right? We've just put in the stuff that, that understands VMDKs, right? That understands not even looking inside VMDKs, but just what, what the layout is for VMware to model the workloads. So presumably this is all the traditional full RESTful API, yes, you know, fully exactly. northbound RESTful by whatever yeah. your storage That's environment right. is. Yeah. Um, flip through the rest of it really fast. There's uh, uh, snapshots built in, right? You can schedule snapshots, you can restore to snapshots, right? It's, it's that end of things. Um, there's uh, showback in terms of charging, so you can tag your VMs, you can assign them to business units, uh, you can price out qualities of, uh, of storage in here, and um, uh, and get showback billing, right? So you can you know, find out who has consumed what in terms of, of capacity. Um, I showed you the, uh, um, the hardware view end of things. Uh, we also have uh, VAI support uh, in the GA um, in terms of fast clones for stuff. Including VCAI for view. Pardon me? Including VCAI for, for view. It's a view yes. fast clone. Yes. Cool. Especially about uh, quads. Yeah. Um, like in a system like this, it seems like, you know, prioritizing I.O. for certain VMs is almost like at that point you need to bring in another box like it should be balanced performance, very high performance for everything. So uh, maybe a little bit different to, you know, the traditional tiering with different disk types and SATA versus SAS with Flash. So um, what's your view on that in terms of quads? Like, I mean, if one tenant gets worse performance than another, is that it doesn't sound like you'd actually be happy with that situation where to arise. No, no, we're not happy with that. Um, and as a, as a hybrid uh, system, that edge very clearly exists. Um, and so this is a point where in the, in the GA, um, we, um, we basically do the best we can, uh, but there's no explicit um, uh, service prioritization. Um, right, so it is, it's, it's great performance, but it's best effort for, for everyone in the, in the GA. Um, there's a whole bunch of work going on that will go into the next major release around much more uh, careful, um, both cross specification, but also isolation of workloads, right? And so one thing that, uh, Forbes will talk about this a little bit, but one thing that's really, really unique in terms of building a storage system on top of Flash is that you know, by taking a step back and thinking about what you're capable of, uh, you can do stuff that, that array vendors have never been able to do on, uh, on disks, right? And so one thing we can do is take a complete IOPS trace, right, of everything, right? So we can persist a trace of every request you put through the system. We can do workload modeling against that, right? So that curve that I drew for you at the beginning around hit rate on cache, right? We can do work in the system to actually draw that curve for every object that you have, right? and assign Flash appropriately, right? It's something that's way too expensive to do on disks because you don't have the I.O. budget to stick that stuff down on disk. But in Flash, it's totally reasonable to, to build that in, so. Andy, you talked about workloads, and, and I liked your point for you. You may have a workload problem and need to tune your workload. That's a challenging statement, of course, from a customer side. 
that, you know, a lot of times we get told that, like, you go, this is what it's going to look like, and we actually profile it on, on disk, and they go, wow, this really doesn't perform as I need it to or I'd hope to, but you can change the workload. What, what are the sort of inappropriate workloads that are going to cause problems for a, a coho data environment? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so, again, the point that I was making about workload is there are two choices, right? One is you can buy more flash, right, and the system will scale out that way. Right, so if you have a working set, we can fit it in Flash. Right, you just have to provision for it. Right, but the other one is if you are bursting, right, because you're stacking up, you know, I/O intensive jobs on top of stuff that you know is you know, latency demanding. Right. you can move them around. Right, so there's a lot of value, I think, in what we've tried to do in the UI in terms of helping the administrator spot those problems. Right, so they can mitigate it. Right, exactly the the kind of you know thing that the customer struggles with. Right, right on that side. Um, pardon me, the workloads that are going to be problematic are workloads with working sets that are bigger than Flash. Right? And the whole design of the system is that that's when you should be scaling out. Right? There is no you know, mixed Flash and disk storage system that is going to behave well once you exceed you know, Flash with a random write workload. Right? And this is actually a really, really important thing to take on when you're benchmarking these systems. Right, when you're, when you're taking you know, hybrid storage systems in and running benchmarks, right, it's, it, you know, it's, it's great if, if your production application is IOMeter, right, then you know, fire away. Um, but if you're going to go run IOMeter random workloads larger than Flash, you know, you're going to get exactly what you expect. Right? That's not what your applications look like. Right? And it's, uh, you need to kind of provision for that. OK. If you find out that you're, you're low on IOPS and you, want, and you, want, and you need more, and yeah. you're trying to scale out, mm -hmm. you can't just buy an extra one of these with just Flash. Not right now. Not right now. And disk. That's right. That's right. Um, and that's something that, uh, that uh, is, is pretty likely to change over the next year. Right? So we're looking at different form factors. Right? We, w one of the things that, that has been really rewarding, actually, about the choice to do this on a, on a hardware appliance has been the qualification effort right, is one piece of hardware for us right now. Right? So I have an incredibly capable engineering team in the company, and they don't waste a huge amount of cycles qualifying every piece of hardware in the universe. Right? They spend their time making it go fast and adding features to it. Right? The, the test for hardware qualification is a lot of work, and it's not something that we wanted to start. And as we go into next year, right, we'll add a few more. <coughs> yeah. Uh, question from Twitter: uh, Is trending done over long periods of time with regard to moving data in and out of Flash? And I was thinking of like the uh, most frequently used, most recently used type of model. You mentioned least frequently used, right? Yes. Well, at least recently used. Or at least right. recently. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we do we do trending um, over time in in the GA. This is definitely like a what we do now versus you know the stuff that we're working on internally, right? The the GA is is LRU, um, and it's over the duration of time that things spend in Flash. Now in in 3.2 terabytes of Flash, right? Things live in Flash for a long time, right? Unless you're really really over provisioning that thing, your data that's in there is in there for quite a while, and so even at that. Uh, it does a, a very good job. Um, but the infrastructure that we're building and the analytics work that's happening around longer term trending is really cool. So you know, hopefully next year uh, I can do a talk just about that because um, there's some pretty exciting stuff happening on that side of, of Coa.